Okay, I thought it would be <clears throat> kind of good to take a little break from thinking about distributions for a minute and just kind of start planting the seed for thinking about hypothesis testing. And specifically, I'm referring to null hypothesis testing, which is pretty much the cornerstone of um, deductive approaches to science. And sometimes it's referred to as frequentist approach. Um, <clears throat> and that's because this type of hypothesis testing is based upon determining how frequently you would see some value if the null hypothesis were actually true. And so um, I thought that this would be a good time to just kind of introduce ourselves to, to thinking about null hypothesis testing. Now, this type of approach to science is not the only approach to learning about the natural world. The other side would be um, one that's based more on inference, which is what Bayesian approaches do, where you just think about the probability of, of your model given your data, and you can make inferences from that. A, uh, a deductive approach, a null hypothesis testing approach, is very much more about setting up a formal hypothesis that you will then either accept or, or reject. And so I'm going to start this out by just doing some very simple approach to hypothesis testing. And I'm going to put myself in the lower left-hand corner today because I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to mix it up. So let's say that we have two different groups. Um, we sampled something, and we went one place, and we sampled, and we got these values for G1, and then we got here these values for G2. So we have these two different groups. And what we'd like to know is do we think that they are drawn from the same population or do we think that those two populations that they're drawn from are different? And so the first thing that we would need to do is we would need to come up with some kind of a, um, a summary statistic that we would choose to compare between the two groups. So let's say that we're gonna take the median. The median is, is pretty easy and straightforward. And so we could set up two hypotheses, um, the first one being the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis being a statement of no effect. And <clears throat> what we can say is the difference in the medians between the two groups is consistent with random draws from the same population, and meaning that we could conclude that G1 and G2 are drawn from the same place as opposed to being drawn from different places. The alternative hypothesis would be that the difference in the medians between the two groups is not consistent with random draws from the same population. And so now we've set up two different scenarios um, where, where that, that are mutually exclusive from one another and they include all possible outcomes. And if we wanted to set this up more formally as a statistical hypothesis, we could say that our null hypothesis is that the median of G1 is equal to the median of G2, G2, G2. And our alternative hypothesis then could be that the median of G1 is, and I can't do a not equal then sign, I don't think, in R, so I will say not equal to the median of G2. Now clearly the medians between those two groups are going to be different from one another. They're always going to be somewhat different from one another. <coughs> what we'd like to know is with what confidence can we say that the medians are either the same or they're not different. And that brings us to a hypothesis testing approach. And so as a, as a first pass through thinking about null hypothesis testing, I'm going to take out an approach that doesn't use any probability density function and none of the formal stats that we might normally, we might normally think about. Instead, I'm going to do what's called a permutational approach. And a permutational approach, as the name implies, simply means that we are going to test this hypothesis by permuting our data, which will essentially be simulating the null. And so our null hypothesis 
is that the difference that we're seeing in the medians between those two groups is what we would expect just by random chance alone if you were to grab um, those samples from that population. So first we can look at, you know, what is, what, what are our medians? That is not how you spell median. That's how you spell median. Median of G1, and we have the median of G2. And so there's our two medians, 4.9 and 8.55. Clearly they're different, but we don't really know what's the probability that you know, they would be that different just by chance alone if we were to just randomly sample from that population. And so how permutational approaches work is we're gonna simulate the null. And we can simulate the null by taking both of our data, right? We have G1 and G2, and we're gonna just, I'm gonna create a new object where I'm gonna combine those together. G1 and G2. Okay, so now that is the pool of possible values that we could have based upon what we've observed. And <clears throat> I'm gonna write a little bit of computer code because that's what I like to do. I'm gonna write a little bit of computer code to simulate the null. And again, the null is that they're all mixed up and part of the same population and then we're just going out there and we're randomly sampling. We're, we're basically um, simulating random draws from that common population and then we can keep track of how big the differences are between those medians. Because right now, our observed difference, and let's just take the absolute value of that. Because we don't care if it's greater than or less than, we just care if it's different. And so right now, the difference between those two medians is 3.65. And what we'd like to know is that if we were to just go into this vector of numbers and randomly select a sample of eight and then another sample of eight, what is the expected difference in the median if they were both part of the same population, which, which they are right now. And so the, I have the code here that I will show that will do this. So obviously I'm doing something with permutations. Whenever you're doing anything with permutations, you should always set the seed because that way you can always replicate your answer. I'm gonna create a new object called random diff, which is just going to be the difference between two random samples, the difference in those medians. And then again, I've already done it, but I'm gonna create this thing called dat, which is both of our samples combined into one. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to do this. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do 10,000 times. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use this function called sample. And what sample will do is it will randomly sample from this vector called dat. It'll take 16 draws, which is the length of dat. So I'm eventually going to sample all of, all of these numbers. And then replace equals false, meaning that once I grab something out of that, I'm not going to put it back in. Um, so what we're doing right now is often referred to as jackknife sampling, where you don't have replacement. If we had replacement, then it would be what's called bootstrap sampling. For our purposes, we're going to just do our sampling um, without replacement. And so every time this gets run, you can see up here, I'm pointing, you can see here, that the numbers are changing. All the same numbers are there, but they're just basically, we're shuffling up the order at which they're at. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a temporary G1 sample, where I'm gonna just take from that random sample the first eight values, and then next I'm gonna take the next eight values, and then I'm gonna compare the median between those two. And so I have my random sample. So the first time I went and did this, that's what I sampled out of that for the first group. That's what I sampled out of that for the second group. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate what the absolute value is um, between the median of those two groups. And I'm gonna do that 10,000 times. So I'm gonna get 10,000 different estimates of what the random difference should look like if they were actually part of the same population, right? I'm simulating the null hypothesis. So I'll go ahead and do this and let the computer think really hard. 
It almost took almost a second. And so now what I have is I have this very long vector called random diff. And it's right there. Look at all those random differences. And actually, if I was so, if I was so interested in doing such a thing, I could make a histogram of those random, random differences. So let's look at that histogram. I gotta get out of the way now. And that's what the histogram looks like for those random differences. Now, our observed difference, which is up here, is 3.65. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll even put a line there. I will say it's a vertical line at 3.65. Six five. I'll make it red, so that way it really stands out. Red, and I'll make it big and fat. Line width equals four. Okay, so that is our observed difference. And then this right here is our null distribution. This is what we would expect it to look like if the null hypothesis were true. So you'll see that just by chance, when we were sampling those 10,000 times, that we had some differences that were greater than 3.65. So next what we would want to do then is we would want to count up the number of times our observed differences observe.diff were greater than our random diff. And recall with these logical statements, that is not a capital I, with these logical statements, it is, what, what is my problem? What is my problem? Oh, I didn't create that. Well, that's a problem. Observe.diff will get the absolute difference. Okay, so again, here's our observed difference. And then we have this long vector of the null hypothesis differences. If I say observe greater than random diff, that's gonna give me a bunch of trues and there'll be some falses, there's a false. And so all we have to do then is take the sum of those and recall that R treats trues as ones and falses as zero. So this is gonna give us the total number of times that we observed our observed difference being greater than a null expectation of what the difference should be. And it happens 9,802 times. If we were to divide that by 10,000, because that's how many samples we have, 98% of the time our observed difference is greater than the random difference when we, just sam when we kept on resampling that, that population. Which means that if we were to subtract one from that, That is our probability that we would observe a difference of six point or 3.65 if they were actual random draws from a common pool of values. And so we have this 0 0.0198, so we can interpret that as our permuted p-value, okay? So an important thing to kind of log into your brain is that a p-value is, it's not the probability that they're different. Um, and it certainly should not be interpreted as how different they are, so that a smaller p-value would mean that they're even more different. What the p-value is, is it's the probability that we would observe a difference of 3.65 given the null hypothesis being true. And the null hypothesis is that they were all drawn from the same population. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize the whole conditional nature of a p-value. And we'll revisit this when we talk more formally about p-values, when we start deriving p-values from probability density functions. And so this was just a very quick kind of intro to thinking about null hypothesis testing. We set up no effect, and then the alternative was an effect. Here we decided that we were gonna use the median, and we were interested in knowing what is the probability that we would observe 
a, a difference in the median of 3.65 if they were actual random draws from the same population. Now, there are situations where we will use permutational hypothesis testing. Um, for the most part, you usually would like to avoid permutational hypothesis testing because when we're resampling these data and randomly, we're really just resampling our samples. We're not really resampling the population, which is why it'll be advantageous for us to think a little bit about using probability density functions because then we have a theoretical expectation of what the true population looks like and we can take our sample to estimate parameters from that distribution Whereas here, our whole universe is only our samples. So all we've really done is shuffled around our samples, but we said, given our samples, what is the probability that we would observe a difference in the median of 3.65? And it's a pretty low probability. And so then we would have to decide, what are we going to do with that? And in most natural sciences, as long as that p value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null and accept the alternative. That 0.05 is entirely arbitrary. And again, it doesn't mean that the alternative hypothesis is correct. What it means is that this is our confidence in accepting the null. And we've decided as a whole field dating back to the 1930s or 20s even, that we would like to be, um, or as soon as we're less than 5% confident, then we can reject the null and accept the alternative. Doesn't mean the alternative is correct, it just means that we're deciding on this one um, piece of information to reject the null. And we'll revisit p-values again when we formally start doing p-values. I just thought that this was a good opportunity to just think really quickly about what we mean by null hypothesis testing and to let you know how permutational hypothesis testing works because for certain applications, there's no other choice but to do permutational hypothesis testing. And so, yeah, plus I thought it'd be nice to take a little break from probability density functions and stuff like that, so. Okay, all right, well, hypothesis test away. <laughs>